Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, latest in our series of conversation events with leading political <coughs> figures. Uh, tonight's guest is Yvette Cooper, um, an MP for what is now almost 20 years, uh, elected in 1997, uh, a government minister under both Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, uh, shadow Home Secretary, uh, amongst other positions, under Ed Miliband, uh, contender for the leadership in 2015, uh, and now chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee. Uh, the format for those of you that have been before is exactly the same. Uh, we will chat for about half an hour, then we'll throw it open to the floor for questions. Uh, I'm going to put my plea in now. Short questions, please, not statements. Uh, and that way we'll get through more of them. Uh, and the second caveat, which some of you will have heard before, is that my, interview, my interviewing style is much more Jimmy Young uh, than Jeremy Paxman. Uh, and uh, so anyone who's come expecting a grilling, uh, you won't get it from me, but you can feel free to ask whatever you like. Um, so given that we're approaching the 20th anniversary of the Labour government, um, and given that you were, I mean, not only were an MP for all, all of it, you were in government for almost all of it, when you look back on it now with hindsight, how does it make you feel? I feel very proud of things the Labour government did. Uh, so many things that I think if we had predicted before 97 that we would change, um, you wouldn't have believed we'd be able to do and were able to. So I'd say, for example, in the 1992 election, um, where Labour had called for more investment in the National Health Service. Uh, there was a general view in the 92 election that no, the, it's not possible for any political party to talk about increasing taxes to put into whether it's the health service or into any other kind of public services. And actually what the Labour government did was it increased national insurance contributions to invest in the National, in the, uh, national Health Service. And so, and that was part of, I think, changing attitudes. It wasn't just the policies we brought in, it was that you changed this public support to do something. Another example would be the big change in LGBT rights and the fact that so many of the different policy changes, whether it was getting rid of Section 28, whether it was what was the, this bringing in civil partnerships, which then led to equal marriage, just deep changes in society and public attitudes that were helped by the Labour government along the way. So I think you know, there were a lot of things. Yeah, there were all sorts of things that we got wrong because governments always do. But some of the big things about changing the country and changing society, I think there was a lot that I feel really proud of. Do you look back on any of it and think, given the size of the majorities, particularly in 97 and 2001, that there was a bit of a missed opportunity there for a left of centre party in government able in parliamentary terms to do almost whatever it liked? I think a lot of the things that we were doing as they happened at the time were felt like radical things to do. So it was obviously the big the national minimum wage for example where I mean the Tories at the time were so opposed to the national minimum wage that they kept the committee going right through the night. And we had a committee session where people were literally sleeping on benches to be there for the vote in order to get it through because they were so desperate to try and block it happening. Now, it may seem obvious now that we've got a national minimum wage, but it wasn't in 1997. If you think about things like Sure Start and the huge support for families, before 1997, there was nothing for the under fives. The, the welfare state just didn't exist for the under fives. You had the, you know, the midwives be there till about 10 days and then when the midwife went home you got nothing and no support at all until your child started school at five and so the big expansion of nursery education of sure start of all of the support the tax credits and support for families with small kids that was a huge transformation so I think there were, were a lot of things now yeah of course you can look back in retrospect and think oh, well, well there are other things as well that we could have done I think for me, the, the things in, in retrospect were not the things that people were talking about at the time, but actually we should have been. So, for example, is um, on housing. The first phase of the Labour government 
the big focus was on improving the standard of council housing because there was, you know, like decades of repairs, terrible. In my constituency, we had rattling windows and, you know, houses without central heating and real long-standing problems in the housing stock, really bad quality housing. Massive capital investment went into the Decent Homes programme, but there wasn't a focus on new building. Mm. And so the new building, whether that be new building of council houses, new building of social housing, new building, actually new building of private housing as well, I think we came too late to needing to have a really big push to increase house building. We did by the end, so by the time we got to the financial crisis, we'd actually had a big surge and a big boost for house building, and then the financial crisis happened, and then, you know, you can see everything that else that happened from there. Do you look back in hindsight, though, and regret that so much of that government, so much energy in that government, particularly at the top level, was wasted on what now seems like very pointless squabbling between groups of people who actually had very similar views, certainly compared to the position the Labour Party's in now. It seems bizarre that groups within the top of the Labour Party were having such vicious infighting. I mean, do you look back on that with regret? Yeah, I think the, um, it is an interesting um, example of what happens when you don't have a strong opposition. And the fact that the Tories were so weak during that period meant that the consequence was that uh, it was possible for people within the Labour Party who didn't disagree on very much to end up effectively rowing with each other uh, and so on. Though I would say, I think some of the tension between uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown did also hold both of them to account. Because actually, sometimes when you have, when everybody, dis when everybody agrees with the Prime Minister, that is also a problem. Because then you can end up with, uh, you know, Prime Ministers can do things which frankly end up, you know, being the wrong thing to do or being a mad thing to do. And, you know, actually, if there had been more disagreement actually at cabinet level, or potentially more disagreement between Tony Blair and Gordon Brown over Iraq, for example, you might have had more challenge <coughs> on that at an early stage. So I think the fact that they, there were tensions wasn't always a bad thing because sometimes it provided the internal challenge and, and kind of need to defend, need to justify policies that otherwise you might not have had. Um, I want to talk about immigration mm. later, given that the Home Affairs Select Committee has got this inquiry on, on immigration. But again, in retrospect, do you now look back on immigration policy under Labour and think that you should have been more alert to public concern earlier? Yeah, I think the big mistake was not to have transitional controls on the uh, accession countries um, in 2004-05. And the part of that, I think, was because uh, the government, across the government, just underestimated the number of people that would come. Part and and people, that, people at the time that said it will, there will be a lot were mocked. I mean, they were openly yeah. mocked for predicting large-scale immigration, and actually they were right. Yeah, They're, and, and the, fig the, look, the figures were wrong. Um, I think there was also... Um, I think the focus was looking at the wider benefits in terms of Europe, in terms of expanding Europe, in terms of relationships with Eastern European countries. There was sort of a lot of foreign policy interest. Of course, the tragedy is in terms of where we are now, now we've got a terrible relationship with Europe as a result of actually anxiety that built up since then. And in, people always talk about, I mean, the conventional wisdom, I suppose, is that one of the most for many people, one of the biggest mistakes of that government was the Iraq war. Yeah. But in terms of domestic <coughs> consequence, you could argue that the uh, lack of transitional controls on the A8 was actually a, a bigger, long, longer term domestic problem. Yeah, I think, the, um, I think that decision has had long term consequences. Um, I think, I mean, it, if part of the argument is, you know, how does that fit with the, the Brexit decision now? I think the, the Brexit decision the country's made now is part of a sort of perfect storm, a whole series of different things all coming together. But there's no doubt that one of those issues is significant anxiety about immigration and particularly um, EU migration and the sense of there being no controls. And I think sometimes people think it's all about numbers. I actually don't, having had lots of dis debates with people around the country about this, a lot of what people will talk about and uh, want to focus on most is actually around 
whether or not you can control and manage migration, it's not simply a, a debate about numbers. Um, again, looking back 20 years ago today, uh, on almost this day 20 years ago, Labour were ahead in the opinion polls by 23 percentage points. Um, two polls out today. Uh, in one of them, you're behind by 70. In another, you're behind by 12. Um, the YouGov one, which has you 17 points behind, has you behind amongst every single demographic group, except the 18 to 24-year-olds who don't vote. Um, so who, who cares? Uh, amongst, amongst those aged 65 and over, Labour's vote share, not the lead, but the vote share is down to 13 percentage points. Um, how does that make you feel? Yeah, it's a bad place, a very bad place for the Labour Party to be. And also at a time when we, I think we need uh, progressive values and we need a Labour government and we need a Labour voice more than ever. And when you see the deep divisions in the country, when you see the widening inequality, when you see the challenges of what's going to happen around Brexit, when you see so many of the different <coughs> problems we face, I mean, I think that a right-wing Tory government makes all of those problems worse and is, has been <coughs> increasing those divisions. So for me, you know, it feels we need a, a Labour government now more than ever, but actually the Labour Party has a long way to go to be in a position to, to make that difference. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a whole series of different things behind that, but one of the other challenges, I think, for us is not to simply become a party of the cities, because increasingly our support now is in cities, but not in towns, and we have lost support in both the kinds of um, Middle England towns that have often the marginal constituencies, but also in Midlands and Northern industrial towns. And so we have to be able to, you know, it's fantastic what Sadiq's done in London, with great support for Sadiq in London, but we've also got to be able to build support and rebuild support in towns across Britain as well. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to the bigger issue of the Labour Party in a second, but just on that issue, this regional divide, which you've, you've written about <coughs> elsewhere, I mean, you're, I think you were born in Scotland, but you grew up in Hampshire. You represent Pontefract. I mean, isn't part of the problem here for this divide, bluntly, that there are too many people born in Hampshire or Surrey or wherever representing places like Pontefract? Well, actually, you've got a lot of um, MPs from all over the country and people also representing places all over the country. So um, I think the, the <coughs> actual issue is that there is a genuine economic divide. So people want to say, oh, this is just all about politics and you know, people not speaking the right language for different voters in different parts of the country. I think that is a cop-out to make it all just about political presentation and language, there is a genuine economic divide. And it's not just about the North-South divide. All right, there's been a historic North-South divide, and <coughs> we were right, the Labour government, I think, was right to put a lot of work into the regeneration of our northern cities. You saw the big transformations in Manchester and Leeds and Liverpool and, and so on. But for me, one of the biggest divides now is between cities and towns. And that is partly about changing technology. So you've got uh, new jobs being created in cities, old jobs disappearing in towns. It's partly about the fact that we live so much of our lives online now. So you're seeing banks, post offices, shops, town centres all disappearing from towns, but still new kind of new retail and leisure opportunities emerging in cities. And it's also when we've had the scale of public spending cuts that the government has been pushing through and the pace of them, it's towns that are losing their public services, losing their swimming pools, losing their, uh, losing their hospitals, losing other kinds of public services. So you have genuinely, towns are being left behind. <coughs> cities are brilliant and growing and that's fantastic, but towns and, and smaller cities as well are being left behind. And so I think, you know, when people talk about the sort of the sense of, you know, kind of, I identity politics and people feeling angry about that and saying, look, we don't feel in control of our town anymore. We don't feel in control of uh, our place and who we are. And we see other changes that feel like they're being imposed on us. Then you then have the, the EU, EU referendum comes into the middle of all of that. 
and actually it is significant that towns that cities were far more likely to vote to stay in and far more likely to feel optimistic about their future <laughs> and opportunities within the current framework towns were far more likely to vote out and be pessimistic and worried about what their future was going to be and therefore to want to see some radical change so for me this is you know this is not just about oh well if we did a little bit of rejigging in the labor party or a little bit of rejigging about our democratic politics or a little bit of rejigging in you know the way political parties work that would solve it no there are some real genuine challenges about what is the economic future for towns because all of the investment is currently going into the cities um, in uh, 2015, when you were fighting for the leadership, um, you gave a speech in which you, I mean, you quite deliberately challenged both Jeremy Corbyn and those supporting him. And, and, and it was noticeable because most people hadn't done that, either because right at the beginning of the contest, they didn't think there was any point because he was clearly not going to win. And then later on, once it became clear that maybe he was going to win, the thing to do seemed to be to sort of suck up to him and his <coughs> colleagues. And, and your speech taking him on was one of... There weren't very many like that. And in it, uh, there was one line that struck me, which was, we can't luxuriate in our own righteousness out on the sidelines. That's not a luxury the most vulnerable in Britain can afford. So I suppose the first question that flashed on that is, is that how you see the Labour Party at the moment? I don't think Labour can be. Is it? Um, is I it? don't think it can ever be. I think, um, I mean, if you think the, the challenge for the Labour Party is we have grown in membership but we have f dropped in support. And so the challenge for us is how do you <coughs> use the, the, the opportunities that comes from having a bigger membership to reach out and to build support. And the trouble is that you know, often people will see the Labour Party as not being central to the big debates about the future, and we have to be. So, um, you know, so yeah, it is a big challenge for us as to how to do that. Um, and also not to just sort of, um, somebody used this example for me of, um, uh, we were talking, this was talking over Christmas about um, uh, when Carrie Fisher died and talking about um, Star Wars and the characters in Star Wars and then, you know, the um, Force Awakens and, and so on, so many years on and saying that actually, you know, the Labour Party can't just be Luke Skywalker who disappears off when something's gone wrong and goes <laughs> off, you know. Can't be Han Solo who just turns up every time it gets exciting but otherwise disappears. Actually, it's got to be General Lear who is there all the way through, still fighting and still, you know, taking on the, sort of the difficult issues. And that's, that should be our, the, our kind of cultural model. I think, I think this is the, the second of only three of these in which Star Wars has been used as a reference point. Um, uh, the, the second thing that you could come off that quote about luxuriating on the sidelines, though, is that you could say that's what you're doing, because you're not on the Labour front bench. You're chairing a select committee. Uh, which, important as it is, is not, I would have thought, central to the political debate in Britain. I mean, to be honest, I think actually in the next two years, the select committees are going to be absolutely central because the biggest challenge we're going to face is what is the details of Brexit and what happens over Brexit. And in fact, having cross-party committees scrutinising the government, challenging the detail of what's happening, being able to expose things, and also to build different kinds of consensus <coughs> is going to be immensely important. So the Brexit committee will be very important, the Treasury Select Committee will be very important, the Foreign Affairs Select Committee will be very important, and I think our Select Committee will be very important. So, look, it's doing different things. And, you know, so uh, there are different ways of having an impact through within the Labour Party and through politics. So the last 12 months before I was elected onto the Select Committee, I was um, chairing the Labour Party's Refugee Task Force, where we were again working cross-party, and we did manage to get the um, Alf Dubbs Amendment through Parliament, which has meant that when the Calais camp closed, as a result of all of the work that had been done with different charities and so on were involved, we did get the government to agree to accept over 700 <coughs> children from Calais. And um, that, I think, was um, a, huge a huge thing to happen as a result of having got that amendment through. There's a lot more that still needs to be, do be done. But 
I think you can make a difference in different ways, and that's not about standing on the sidelines. Sometimes it's about taking on some of the most difficult issues that sometimes are easier to deal with from the back benches than just as, as a front bencher. Um, the, the big one, because you've just launched this year-long inquiry into immigration, and my, my first thought on hearing that the Home Affairs Select Committee was going to have a year-long inquiry on immigration was, <coughs> haven't, haven't we talked about immigration enough? I mean, it, you know, there's the, the claim that it's the topic that politicians don't discuss, but actually you can't move in the last 10 years for discussions about immigration. What, it, what is a new year-long Select Committee inquiry going to add? I think the, the problem is that the debate hasn't really been about talking, it's tended to be about too often about shouting and too often being a polarised debate. And having had sort of some meetings around the country, I think there is actually more consensus around immigration than people think sometimes. And I think if we don't address this apparent polarisation in the debate about immigration and about what kind of country we want to be, about the way in which we properly manage or control the immigration system so that you can get both the benefits of immigration but also have public consent for the system. If you don't actually try and do that and build consent across the country, then I think you end up uh, just with the sorts of deep divides that will end up just polarising us and have far wider repercussions than we've already seen. So what we want to do is have our select committees going round the country, different regional hearings, having public meetings. In and, all, and asking people, okay, where's the common ground? What is the, the consensus that you could set out that would, given there will be immigration reforms over the next two years, what actually should there be? What would be the sensible way in order to do it? Um, Brexit. Um, two thirds of the, I mean, the estimate is that two thirds of your constituents voted to leave. And you've, you've said that you weren't surprised by the overall result. Um, and you've said, I think, that in your view, the country, Labour, the Parliament has to respect that result. Um, it strikes me as a really interesting one for someone like you, and maybe for democratic politics in, in general, because presumably you don't just think this is a mistake, you presumably think this is a potentially, potentially catastrophic mistake. And so respecting the result for you means voting for something that you actually think could be extremely damaging for the country and for your constituents. Now, you, you might be wrong in that, and you might be right, but given that that is presumably what you think, these votes are going to be quite tough. Um, given that it's in the news today, I assume you would vote, given what you said before, you would vote to trigger Article 50 when the government tries to, assuming it requires a parliamentary vote, you would vote for it. Yeah, I mean, I think the problem here is that what actually happens with Brexit and what the consequences are for the country depends very much on what the government does next. So there's still a huge wide open question about the impact that Brexit has on the country depending on the decisions the government makes. I am very concerned about what Theresa May said about wanting to be outside the customs union as well as the single market and what the impact of that will be on manufacturers particularly um, and just the, the knock-on impact in terms of um, uh, manufacturing jobs um, across the country. I think the... Um, but we, we had a referendum. The thing I feel more concerned about than any possible scenario, because we don't know yet what those are going to be, is the idea of becoming a country that no longer respects democratic values. And... I think that matters. We've had a referendum. We didn't go into that referendum, those of us who are campaigning in the referendum, and we didn't go into that referendum saying, look, I want you to vote Remain, but to be honest, don't matter how you vote, I'm going to ignore you. We didn't go into that referendum saying whatever. You know, If we'd had a referendum on capital punishment, for example, I could never vote for capital punishment. Whatever happens, I just think it is morally wrong. And I would have said so. If we were having a national referendum, I would have said, look, I'm not only campaigning to persuade other people to vote against capital punishment, but I'm also just saying I'm not ever going to be able to morally vote for capital punishment. That's not what happened in the EU referendum. It was a referendum that was fought in good faith, and nobody said at any time, but you know what, I'm just not going to respect the result afterwards. That's the kind of thing that Donald Trump says, and he did say it before 
the presidential election, and we all were appalled and horrified that he was saying that about the outcome of a, uh, of a vote uh, and of their elections there. And I think at a time when it seems to me that there is a sort of declining support for democratic values, and I would uh, add to that things like, I mean, you know, the evidence from the states we've seen, and it's not just the way Trump behaved, but also evidence about even the number of young people in the states no longer supporting democracy as a kind of, as the right institution, the right <coughs> form of government. What you've seen in, in Britain by um, the, the huge hostility that was uh, meted out towards the judiciary for making the judgment about Article 50 in the first place, well, they're just doing their job in terms of having to interpret the law, but the hostility towards the judiciary, the attempt by some, I think, on the far right to try and pitch the public against Parliament, when actually Parliament should be the voice for the public and should be the democratic voice for the public, to me, and then you have all of the fake news and all of the things that are sort of undermining almost any sense of standing up for truth and for, um, for honest debate within a democracy, I think right now we have to, if we are Democrats, be ready to stand up for our democratic values. And that's about you know, the rule of law and human rights. It's not just about what happens in terms of, of majority votes. But I don't see how I could go out there and say it is so important to stand up for democratic votes and say, but there's this democratic vote we just had that I never said I wasn't going to respect and I'm not going to respect it and, now. And that trumps all other concerns. Does it? Because you, you've said elsewhere that you want, a, a, the phrase you used was a progressive and patriotic deal. Yeah. Uh, but what, what if at the end of this, I mean, triggering Article 50 seems to me the least important bit, because that's clearly going to happen and there'll clearly be a majority for it, um, even if a vote is required. But then when the details of that deal become clear, what if there are things there that you think are just wrong, that Theresa May hasn't got the deal you want, that it's... N it's n either not progressive or patriotic, or maybe neither, or maybe both, if not either of them. What, what do you do then? I think that the, the debates that we're going to have through <coughs> Parliament, we, we don't know yet what opportunities there will be to vote on different aspects of it all along the way. And I think there is a huge argument to be had about what kind of Brexit this means. So, for example, what Theresa May said about, um, you know, if we don't get the deal that we want... What she's going to do is uh, effectively rip up the UK model, UK economic model, and slash taxes, uh, slash regulations in order to become uh, effectively undercutting European businesses, undercutting <coughs> the European model. Uh, I mean, that is the kind of thing that we will get to vote on in Parliament but, and but, be able but to vote on. The bit about whether you're in so, or out in the end, when there is a vote on that, and she said there will be a vote on that, you no, can we, see. We actually, we don't know that yet. Because what we don't know, she said there will be a vote. At the moment, we don't know what that vote will be and what the options will be in that vote. So is that going to be a vote for whatever deal they put together or versus WTO rules as an alternative? Well, Do you see what I well, mean? Well, David, so David Davis says it is. He, he says this is the assumption underpinning his claim that whatever happens, we're leaving. Once Article 50 is triggered, since it's irrevocable in his view... There can't be a vote in Parliament on staying in. It will be a vote on do you accept the deal or is it WTO? Exactly. So I think, there, therefore, the, the challenge is what you should have, I think, is you should have a process where you have a series of votes on the deal, including, well, actually, you can amend this and say, no, we should do something else. <coughs> now, we don't know how possible that's going to be or what the government is going to do, but I think they should be coming up with a proper process, a proper parliamentary process, and that's what we're attempting to do with the select committees, to actually look at the detail around the merits of being in or out the customs union, for example, or the merits of what other aspects, another area, for example, if the government comes up with a proposal, for example, which involves withdrawing from Europol, having no replacement, no um, security arrangements, and no ability to access security information, then I think there would be a lot of people that would have vote against that bit and would vote instead for something else. But we don't know how far we're going to have the opportunity to look at each area in turn and say, look, this is what we should be doing. But I think what the government really should be doing is this, the decisions that will be taken in the next two years are going to have an impact on the country for decades to come. And it's not just the binary decision, it's also the decisions on how you come up with a new settlement 
And I think what we have to do is to be trying to get a sensible debate across the country on each of those different things. I think it does have to have reform on immigration. I know some people think it shouldn't. I think it does have to have reform on immigration. I said before, and, and, I think free and, movement's and by, not by, a by, by reform, you mean the, the end of free movement for EU citizens coming, or at least controls on EU citizens. What about, and then we'll uh, throw it open to the audience, what about two other aspects that you might have the chance to vote on, um, and I wonder whether you think they would be an essential part of honouring the referendum result. Um, do you see membership of the customs union, continued membership of the customs union, as compatible with honouring the referendum result? Yeah. Okay. Do yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Would you I see, would you see yeah. continued member of the sing membership of the single market as compatible with so honouring the referendum result. The single market is quite a complicated one. So I think it would be quite possible to be in the customs union and also still be withdrawn from the EU institutions. The, the single market um, issues, I think we should be trying to stay in the single market, but I also think we should be trying to reform free movement. And that is a challenge because other European countries take a different yes. view. My view was before the referendum because I thought we always would need reforms to free movement. And I thought that actually you could have had that debate within the EU, and it would have taken time, but I think other countries would have been interested in having sensible economic, sensible immigration reforms um, as well. I mean, look, immigration is really important for Britain, and we will need immigration for the future, but we also need it to be controlled and managed so that the system is fair and has public consent. And I think there are ways in which that you could do that, but that's one of the things we'll be having our immigration inquiry all over the country is actually asking people how to do that. So I do think it was possible if, if David Cameron had taken a different approach rather than rush into this the kind of referendum having not properly had a long-term debate with the rest of Europe, I think it would have been possible to look at ways in which you could have sensible reforms to free movement and be in the single market as well. From where we are now, that is much harder and in becomes even more harder if the debate becomes sort of tense and belligerent. But I think it is something we should be trying to do, is to try and get a sensible combination of approach to both trade and immigration together. Because when you're talking about globalization, you know, the globalization of goods, the globalization of people, the globalization of finance, and getting them to work in a way that supports communities, rather than just taking a free market approach to all of them, um, I think you, you can find ways to do that, but you have to do it in a sensible way. What about paying into the budget? Would that honour the referendum result? If we, ca if we carried on contributing to the EU's budget in return for some deal over the customs union? If you want to be in Europol, and I think there is a strong case to either be a full member or an associate member of Europol, then they've got staff, they've got people, they've got, they do really important work dealing with trafficking gangs, dealing with you know all kinds of... Um, uh, criminal issues, intelligence gathering, and so on. So, of course, you would expect to be paying in this okay, part. But that's, of that. that's 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 small change compared to sure. But it's a sim it's a okay. symbol. Of, okay, so symbolic. It's a symbolic. So, so, so symbolic. Of, you're you know, okay in with order it. to in order to get things out. So you're you'd be okay with the idea of paying in, but as long as the sums of money were what if the sums of money began to get more substantial? The thing is, you're kind of asking me what is the detail of the negotiation, but who knows where this is going to end up. I think at this stage in the process, all you can do is sort of set out what are the principles that we think the government should be pursuing and challenge the government to come back with, OK, here's what the options are, here's what the proposals are. So far, they've not done so, for example, on immigration. And the consequence of which is we're going to have a um, select committee hearing next week, beginning of next week, where we will ask um, experts, including the Migration Observatory, <coughs> including different think tanks and organisations, what do they think the different options are and what do they think the consequences would be of each approach, so that you can have that public debate about what the consequences would be and what the trade-offs would be as part of it. Because I think, um, you know, this is... We are only going to get a sustainable solution if there is that public debate beforehand rather than the government just trying to do it all behind closed doors. And I know that is a difficult thing to say because they're going to have a negotiation and that is complicated and they obviously can't set out all the details of the negotiation. But alongside the negotiation with the EU, they also have to come up with a package that has 
public support in this country, and that means not just public support from those who voted to leave, but public support from the majority of those who voted to remain as well. Okay. I can't claim that the audience is in any way representative. In fact, probably the only thing I can claim is that it's not. Uh, but let's throw it open to members of the audience to ask their questions. If we could see some hands going up. Let's start here, please. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'd like to ask you a question in your capacity as previous Secretary of the Treasury. And this is not about politics of the Labour Party or Brexit. Um, why is it that what happens in government, we know what happens in government, is different to what politicians say? So my question to you is, why don't politicians tell the people the truth? The government hasn't got money because of the financial crisis of 2008 <coughs> for things like adult social care. Sorry, council today is proposing to raise 15% of the council tax. Um, the Brexit thing was out 350 million pounds a week if we leave. All of the things that have been discussed and mentioned here all relate to a result of a lack of government funding as a result of the financial crisis, but nobody ever mentions that. When are people going to be told the real truth? So, I think the, I think lots of people have talked about the consequence of the financial crisis and um, the, the increase in debt as a result of the financial crisis, which then meant the deficit look, had to come back down again, and that did lead to a whole series of government decisions about the spending cuts that they made. Um, and so I think you're right that people often, and certainly the, what the Conservative and Liberal Democrat the coalition government said straight after the 2010 election, was um, they, uh, they would often not attribute that to the financial crisis and would attribute it in the stead to, oh, it must be Labour spending decisions, whereas actually it wasn't Labour spending decisions that caused Lehman Brothers in New York to crash. So you're right that we should do more to say it was actually the financial crisis and the crisis in global finance that then had a knock-on effect on the public finances. And still does. I think, yeah, and still does. Although I think the decisions made by government since then have also had an impact. So government since then has chosen um, to... Uh, I think cut public spending at a pace that meant that's also slowed, had meant slower growth. It's also meant that they have um, had cuts in corporation tax or made cuts in inheritance tax and so on, which have also reduced the tax base. So you're right that the deep underlying thing is about what happened in the financial crisis and the fact that governments across the world had to step in and rescue economies faced with that crisis in the private sector. But in addition, I think there are further decisions that have been taken since then. Um, there was a hand at the back there. Yes, you. Uh, yeah. you? Yes. Um, so, um, as a Democrat, I'm just interested in your idea as to why it may be perceived as anti-democratic to try and democratically overturn a democratic decision, because after all, the recent referendum we had democratically overturned a decision that was taken in the 1975 referendum. It just seems to me that democracy requires us constantly to be challenging these ideas, and if we disagree with them, that's legitimate to disagree, but also to campaign against them. And from what you said, it seems to be a decision to be taken, and therefore that decision will last forevermore without any further attempts by people who disagree with that decision to try and have it overturned. So I'm just unclear as how you reconcile being a Democrat with remaining silent. I think um, uh, the debates will always continue. Uh, and should, and there should always be challenge, and you know, who knows where we'll be in 10 years' time, and who knows what the decisions will be. But I think for, um, uh, for me as somebody who was elected in 2015, before the referendum happened, um, who campaigned in good faith in that referendum, and the constituents, those who, people who elected me in 2015, who then voted to leave when the referendum happened, and I didn't go out and say to them, I'm just going to ignore your views in the referendum. I campaigned in the referendum to persuade them to remain, and that's not the decision that they took. So that's why I think that this decision this year, I don't think it's right to block Article 50. I do think it is right to argue really strongly about what kind of Brexit 
we should have and to argue strongly against the government going for either um, some people talk about it being a kind of hard Brexit, let's hit the economy hard. I also think the danger is as well, they're talking about a very right-wing Brexit with this idea that if they don't get the, um, the kind of deal they want, instead going for cutting, uh, you know, cutting taxes and cutting regulations and cutting employment rights. I also think there's a really interesting question as well, is that some of the stuff that the, um, the Tory right talk about, about saying they're going to have... Uh, free trade that's going to solve it with all these trade deals with other countries, you know, are they seriously though going to put in environmental standards into those trade deals, employment rights into those trade deals, because the point about a single market is it was a combination of good trade deals with also having the kind of social, environmental and economic regulation to underpin that, to try to make that fair for everyone. And so the idea of sort of free trade on its own without that kind of support, I think is a problem as well. So all of those things about where we go from here, there's a huge range of, of choices that have to be made, and every single one of those you can argue about along the way. I just sort of follow up on that. Just as a, as a remoter, um, as I describe myself, I think there is a massive frustration about the people who voted to remain, that those people in Parliament, like yourself, who we know oppose Brexit, are going to be voting for it, and by virtue of that, there's a sense of disenfranchisement by those 48%. 8.1% of people who uh, disagree with the decision. So that's a massive democratic gap that occurs simply because um, our elected representatives are not standing up for those things on which they stood on platforms in the, uh, in the 2015 election. I'm not saying it's easy, but it does leave a massive tranche of the population that has their views completely unrepresented and heard in Parliament. I think also what it highlights is how difficult referendums are. Because somebody said to me um, uh, straight after the Scottish referendum and um, someone who had campaigned for Scotland to stay in the United Kingdom um, said, he said the problem with the referendums is the, it's so divisive because you're voting against your neighbours' hopes and dreams. And it's the binary decision and the, the sort of one-off nature of it that to make these sorts of huge decisions uh, in that way. Now, maybe, you know, when you're talking about big constitutional decisions, it's hard not to, to make them through a referendum. But the consequences in terms of the, um, the, the sort of deep divisions that they bring, but also for those who um, were on the other side of whatever the referendum outcome is, then feeling disenfranchised. In Scotland, of course, those who felt disenfranchised by the result then had an election in which that actually they could focus on increasing devolution to Scotland. And so there was a, a sort of a focus for that. The challenge, I think, for, um, for us in terms of the, the, the referendum for Brexit, I think has to be not only dealing with can you come up with a progressive approach to handle what's happened with Brexit, can you also start to deal with some of what I think were the deep divisions that underlie it, like start to come up with a new consensus around immigration and deal with this massive inequality between cities and towns and the kind of wider inequality that I think has also driven it as well, and look for ways to start to reunite our country which is hard, because if we carry on with this sense of the divide and disenfranchisement, whichever group is it that feels disenfranchised, we don't have a healthy democracy. And that feels to me to be the most worrying thing of all. Not, in the end, what is our precise relationship with an EU institution, but what actually is the health of our democracy. I, I liked your 48 point, the 0.1%. So it reminded me of my, my dad. Is, my dad is five foot four and a half, and the, the half is really, really important to him and, and always gets mentioned. There was a, a woman on the back row, yeah. Um, I'd like to digress a little bit into gender and politics. Um, so the Labour Party, I know, I think, percentage, you're talking about percentages, um, does take the lead over other parties in, in Parliament currently. But why is it, as uh, you know, the Labour is the party apparently for social injustice, for social justice why haven't they entrusted their faith in a female leader? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, we have obviously had um, uh, two uh, acting leaders, women leaders, and Harriet Harman and Margaret Beckett as well. Um, we have far more women MPs 
than any other party um, and have done a huge amount uh, in history to get um, uh, more women into politics and into Parliament as well. I am sure eventually we will have a woman leader of the Labour Party, but it's, I think the more we have more women going into politics and certainly going into Labour politics, the easier that will become. But, but it isn't, there is a problem, isn't there? I think, I think it's true that in conservative leadership contests, uh, now there haven't been many female contenders, but when there has been, uh, a man has never polled better than a woman in any conservative leadership contest. And in Labour leadership contests, the opposite is true. No woman, I think, has ever polled higher than a man in a Labour leadership contest. So there is a systemic problem in the party, isn't there? I don't know. I think um, if you look at what happens in terms of local elections and uh, constituencies and so on, we've done a lot more. Um, so our challenge has been at national level. We've obviously got, had women deputy leaders who've been elected. So we have had women successfully <coughs> deputy leadership, um, just not at the leadership. Um, and I think the, I mean, if you look, you know, constituencies across the country, we've had a lot more, you know, women candidates and so on. So, look, you know, I can't say, oh, you know, the Labour Party solved this because we clearly haven't. But um, I don't think this is about the whole of the Labour Party because in various aspects, actually, um, not only have we got more women, we have also led the way in terms of women's equality and in terms of changing women's <coughs> lives as well. So how, how is it the Conservative Party that hasn't done those things, has ended up with two women leaders. I know, and especially when they've also not, often not done stuff for women's equality, because the, um, I mean, if you look, for example, I mean, I got this, the, I did some work with House Commons Library to do this sort of gender analysis and gender audit, because the Treasury refused to do gender audits of their budgets. And actually, when Labour was in government, we used to occasionally do the gender audits, because I got... Um, I found a parliamentary question I'd asked of Treasury Ministers back in 1999 about the, the gender impact of the budget so far then, and it showed women had, I think it was, women had benefited on average by about £5 a week, and men had benefited on average by about £2.50 a week. It was a time we were introducing tax credits and things like that, and minimum wage as well. So we had actually done more to help women. Um, and in terms of this, that sort of wallet purse issue, whereas if you look at what the Tories have done since 2010, the, uh, I think it's something like 80% um, uh, of the money that's effectively been taken from people's pockets as part of all of the changes to tax, benefits, pensions and so on, 80% of it has come from women, even though women still earn less and own less than men. So the reality of what they've done has been much tougher for women, but you're right, in terms of within their ranks, they have elected women as leader. It just, you know, hasn't benefited women as a consequence. Uh, yeah, there. Um, my question is on uh, Home Place Select Committee inquiry on English language test. And um, do you only think 54,000 students have been uh, facing this issue and their life is in limbo? Don't you think this is because of the parliamentary policy of deport first and appeal later. And don't you think the same thing will be happening after the <coughs> towards the immigrants? Home office can always charge any kind of thing as they have done on the international students um, over there, other immigrants as well after the Brexit. What do you say on this? So um, we voted against that measure when it came through Parliament because, and we thought it was partly as well because the Home Office initial decisions that it makes too often are wrong mm -hmm. and are then, you know, the appeal success rate was relatively high um, and therefore, you know, you're kind of, um, you're disrupting people's lives over a wrong decision and that is making it harder. I think in terms of, um, I mean, I don't, um, think that the, the sensible future immigration rules for the <coughs> EU should be the same as those for outside the EU. Mm -hmm. uh, some people think they should, but I don't, because I think you have to take the approach to um, what happens within the EU as being link, linking around single market, around trade and around um, immigration and look at all of those things together. And we have, um, we've always, you know, for a long time had 
uh, people coming from the rest of Europe in order to work in so many different areas where we have skill shortages, where actually it's been part of our economy and so on. So I don't think we will end up, I don't think the government will go down the track of trying to have exactly the same system for the EU and for outside the EU, but the truth is we don't know yet. If it happens, do you think that there should be a change in this policy? Otherwise, so many people will be affected by this particular situation. Yeah, I mean, I voted against it when it came through, so, okay. yeah. Um, what about on, on a, a sort of related subject, um, which you sparred with the Prime Minister about at the Liaison Committee, about the inclusion of students in the immigration statistics? Um, I, I happened to go and read, reread Enoch Powell's <coughs> Rivers of Blood speech the other day for some teaching, and it's noticeable that even Enoch Powell even Enoch Powell explicitly excludes students from immigration. <laughs> and and, and I, I, I don't quite understand the logic for doing so. I mean, do, do you get any sense of any movement on this, or is it just firm and bending? On this one, I really, I just don't get it. I do not get where, and this is Theresa May as well herself, mm. this is her yeah. issue. Um, I just don't get where she is coming from on this at all. And <clears throat> I think the problem is, they got sort of stuck on this net migration target, which, you know, <coughs> way off meeting, but it's, it's also it treats different kinds of immigration as the same. And not only does it include students when, you know, that obviously plays a completely different economic role to other kinds of, of migration, it also includes refugees. And... The idea, I think, that you could have a target for net migration which includes refugees and therefore means you're giving the Home Office an incentive to try and reduce the number of refugees, the people who are fleeing persecution and uh, you know, have no safe home to return to, and they have an incentive to try and reduce that, personally, I think is immoral. So I would not only remove refugees, but uh, remove students from the target, but also remove refugees. From the target, but I think the, actually the bigger challenge from the government is why they have a single target for all immigration in this way at all, rather than just taking a different <coughs> approach to different kinds of migration instead. I mean, her, her response is, as I understand it, that this is the internationally accepted definition of immigration. But that's the, she, she chose to target it. Yes. So, yeah, fine, okay, there will always be a measure <coughs> of net migration, and there'll be a statistical measure of net migration that people add up. The question is what you choose to make the focus of your target. And that's what the Prime Minister has chosen to do and other, um, other cabinet ministers, to be fair to them, also don't think is appropriate, as well as, I think, um, obviously the Labour Party and other parties as well. I've always assumed it's because they, they, can, they can achieve something with it. So, so whatever, not, I mean, well, well, whatever, whatever, well, whatever damage it does to the university oh, sector. I mean, it might do I terrible see. damage to the university sector, but they can, that's, a, that's a bit they can at least control. Yeah. The other bits they find much harder to yeah. control, and therefore, however damaging, yeah. they might be it. But you know, students bring billions of pounds into Britain and into the British economy, and the sort of international exchange of ideas is just so important. But, um... Not in my seminars, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, right, uh, yes, chap here. Yeah. Uh, in our political system, uh, the government needs a strong opposition. Uh, someone that can scrutinise it and hold it to account. Many people would say that Labour aren't that strong opposition at the moment. Um, what threats do you see the Liberal Democrats uh, presenting? As, of course, they do very well in local council elections. Um, they just won Richmond Park. Yeah, the Richmond Park was obviously a constituency they'd held before um, as well. I think... I mean, you know, look, there's, um, in the end, the Liberal Democrats were happy to sign up to massive cuts to tax credits, you know, massive cuts to uh, spending on things like social care and local government and big increases in tuition fees. And, um, you know, I don't think they provided the internal opposition in the government that they should have done if they were prepared to go into <coughs> coalition. Um, so it's, you know, they, they obviously have a sort of campaigning advantage in Richmond Park and 
politics as well is quite volatile at the moment, and so people are kind of, you know, sort of shifting around um, as well. But in the end, for me, the sorts of things that the Liberal Democrats were prepared to do as a party was just too right-wing. And so, in the end, look, that means that the onus on us as a party to argue for something different as an alternative, and, um, uh, and we have to be able to do that um, uh, both nationally and locally, because you're right that there are some areas of the country where they've done well in local by-elections as well. Really um, quickly come back. Go on, very quickly. Um, I mean, you talked just then about the coalition, which of course was 2010 to 2015, but I'm, I'm talking about right now, they are doing a lot better. And voters increasingly are actually seeing they did good things in the coalition. So the picture right now is not 2010, it's, it's that the Lib Dems are picking up support for everyone. I think, though, well, they were in that government from 2010 to 2015. It wasn't just the decisions that they made in 2010, it was the decisions that they made over five years. If, um, look, if you're uh, interested in a particular single issue, and that's something that the Liberal Democrats are championing right now, you may well be tempted to vote for the Liberal Democrats. If what you're interested in is a broader kind of approach to, to values and to the kind of country that we want to be, then you've got a different choice to make. And for me, you know, in the end, the sorts of things that the Lib Dems uh, stood for and argued for during that period, I think did have a knock-on impact to where we are today. The kind of widening inequality across the country, the sense of some communities and areas just feeling further and further left behind and not being able to, to address that. And okay, look, they were the minority partner within that coalition, but I still think you know it's right to sort of challenge them on those decisions as well. If your challenge to me is should the Labour Party be doing more right across the country, both to challenge the government and to, to be working on what an alternative vision should be of the country, that both provides reassurance for those who feel fearful about the future and provides opportunities for those who want to be optimistic for the future, yeah, you're absolutely right, the Labour Party's got a lot more work to do. If what you're saying to me is that the Lib Dems are the answer, then I guess I beg to disagree. Um, Chap in the second row. I want to call it judiciary service. Actually, I just wanted to come back, and get, come back again to the immigration area. Mm. I see every day uh, the public funds being drained, actually, in the magistrate courts as a result of foreign criminals, which, and I'm very strong. Uh, you know, supporter of deporting workers. What's your view on that? I mean, we see the public funds on a daily basis, taxpayer money being spent on cases that the people that comes in, they actually plead guilty. Come to the country, six months later, they're being caught and they plead guilty. What is, what there is on the opposition side that they can offer an idea you know, to uh, remedy this problem, which it, it is the public finance, and you know, uh, that is it's a drain as a result. Is that, is that the issue about people um, putting pressure on the court system because they don't court plead system, guilty absolutely. until the last minute? Is it about immigration absolutely. cases and, and deportation cases or which? They are represented by, uh, by the public funds. They have to be represented because of Article, uh, article 6 of the Human Rights Act. So they use that. They, this is, I see, it on a daily basis, and there are so many people in the judiciary service, people in, the, in that sector, who are very uh, disenfranchised with government and with the civil servants high up. We don't seem to be able to reach you, <coughs> the people who are our voice in parliament. And, there are, and I'm one of the, the people that I speak with, magistrates, with uh, judges, and they say, We've been told from higher to actually give them union that sentence and to just leave them up. Now this is cause, causes a lot of problem on the policing. You know, it causes a lot of problem spending money on uh, you know on uh, basically the judiciary process that we have, we have to put them through. Of course, the taxpayer we work it out one day and causes a case. Uh, you know, something in the region of eight thousand to sixteen thousand pounds to bring a case up to court for somebody, a single individual. Just think about the two <coughs> days you could spend that money in the NHS. Okay. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to be um, 
So I think the um, I think immigration rules should be enforced. Um, I think um, that well that depends on which rules they are. So you know so I think um, I think therefore that does mean that you need to to have a, a sort of system that that is able to to do deportations for the the problems with the foreign foreign criminals and. Um, uh, the Homes Affairs Select Committee, before I was elected as chair, has actually done quite a lot of work on this, and so Keith Vance had raised this a lot of times, that there is a, the government has always been incredibly slow in just getting the proper deals in place to be able to return foreign criminals to their home countries and to have prison deals um, in their home countries. And so I think there's been a lot of um, just you know, slow systems in terms of getting those systems in place. And actually, we should be able to do that far more effectively. And similarly, that would mean if people are currently in jail abroad who are Brits who ought to you know, be returned as well as part of the reciprocal arrangement. So I can't answer you as to why that bureaucracy might be working too slowly or whether there's more than that. If your point is about should people have... Um, legal aid in, in sort of criminal cases and, and so on, or, um, you know, so I, mean, I do think you've got to make sure that justice is done, clearly, but, but you ought to also have a system that works more effectively. Okay, then. Uh, woman at the back, please. Um, so in 1989, you were Under Secretary of State, clearly a huge part of New Labour. Um, what do you think about the position that New Labour carried on a Thatcherite mantle? So I don't think it was remotely Thatcherite to have a national minimum wage to um, bring in Sure Start. I was um, elected as, um, sorry, I was appointed first. My first job was a um, health minister um, in 1999. And the, um, I mean, one of the things I was responsible for was the rollout of Sure Start. And there's no way either Margaret Thatcher or a Tory government would have done that just in a zillion years. Um, we also brought in free fruit in primary schools. You know, Margaret Thatcher took the milk away, we brought the fruit back. And, um, and that was actually, that was one of my uh, policies. And we had, I had a really keen press officer in the Department of Health who said, when we uh, announced it, said, oh, I've got a great slogan for you. It's, we should say, it's Margaret Thatcher, milk snatcher, Tony Blair, free pears. <laughs> we decided not to use that in the uh, press release that we put out. Um, I think, look, I, I think things like as well saying we've got to invest in the National Health Service as well. Margaret Thatcher, again, would never have done that. And we're prepared to raise national insurance contributions in order to put in the National Health Service. I think the area where um, actually we should have done more was around, particularly around the regulation of finance and the regulation of uh, the city. And that clearly was a failing. And it's a failing, look, it's a failing that many other countries made across the world and also that other parties were making as well. But nevertheless, Labour was in government during that period and we should have done far more on that because when the financial crisis happened it wasn't just about what happened with the investments in the subprime mortgage market in the united states it was the fact that there were all these complex international financial products that went round the world and back again and nobody knew where the risk lay and nobody was properly regulating it and nobody was properly dealing with that risk at all so that clearly was a failing the other thing i think that was Again, I, I talked about housing earlier on as well, being something that we just came to too late. I think the other thing was the, what was happening to wages for uh, the low and middle income wage growth has started to stall in the mid-2000s. And then because of the financial crisis, actually there was then no way to start to deal with that, but there was something deeper going on in the economy, and that's partly linked to changing technology and the fact that um, simply saying you're going to provide better education wasn't enough to deal with those widening wage inequalities. But um, I think, look, by the time we were in um, opposition, it was something that Ed Miliband obviously talked about a lot and something the Labour Party talked about a lot. But I think, again, it was something that we came to late. But, you know, compared to the contrast, Margaret Thatcher, who, you know, I remember... The, uh, 1980s, the, mid, the early 1980s and mid-1980s, when people I was at school with were leaving school and going on to the YTS, which was a sort of dead-end 
uh, no chance of properly getting a job, youth unemployment soaring, and youth unemployment of over a million, we had unemployment of over three million. When we had the financial crisis and the Labour government dealing with the financial crisis, and by that time I was a Secretary of State in the Department for Work and Pensions, everything we were doing was all about stopping youth unemployment rising, because we just were scarred by the experience of the 1980s where when you and in the early 90s when you let a generation of young people not have any job or any opportunity for years then that then scars them for life and we were determined not to let that happen again and so we brought in the future jobs fund margaret thatcher would never have had the future jobs fund it was like proper good jobs and things for young people to get them into a job guaranteed job for people to go into in the financial crisis that meant you had that cushion that provided support for people while the economy was going through such a difficult time. And, you know, for me, what I remember of, of the Thatcher years was uh, what they did to youth unemployment. What I take out of what we did as a Labour government was stopping youth unemployment rising like that and bringing it so that it was coming down even before we left office. But isn't the question really interesting? Because isn't part of your problem, by your, I don't mean Labour, I mean the sort of, you know, those of you that stood and were beaten by Jeremy Corbyn in 2015, isn't part of your problem collectively, it wasn't, wasn't part of your problem collectively, that there are lots of people who think that, that part of the record, part of the problem of the Labour governments from 2010, from 97 to 2010, is that lots of people think they weren't radical enough, they were Thatcher right. I mean, that's a real problem that the government, the Labour Party's got, isn't it, I think? I think, um, I think it's part of this goes back to your point, I think, early on about, you know, why do we not do more to point out that, you know, it was a financial crisis and a global financial crisis that caused the, uh, the deficit to rise, not Labour's public spending. So I think there's been quite a bit of, um, you know, the left wanting to attack its own. And rather than say, be honest about actually the things that we did, the things that we didn't do, but also the amazing things that we did as well. You know, we lifted hundreds of thousands of kids out of poverty. What the Tories are doing, they're shoving kids back into poverty so that they're having to go to food banks in the 21st century, which is shocking. And more, this, having so many people having to depend on a food bank in order to put a hot meal on the table. Labour had done the opposite over very many years. And we have got to be strong enough to say that and to defend that. It's a brilliant interview with Angela Rayner. Um, today, yes, today online, you've yeah, exactly yeah. talking about what difference, the reality of the difference that made to her as a single mum having a Labour government. Do you think you didn't say enough of that so, at yeah. the time? So I think there's, there's part of that is actually we should be ready to to stand up and actually defend the things that happened. I think there is also a bit of a tendency. It's the flip side of Tea Party Republicanism. It's that the easy thing to do when things get tough is to say, let's blame politics. And let's say, oh, it's politics the problem, and politics is all the same. Whereas actually, if you're on the left, you need politics in order to deliver progressive change. And if what you end up doing is knocking politics and knocking political institutions so much that everybody thinks they are all the same and they can never make a difference, is actually you also take away your own power to make any difference because it's easy for the right, because in the end, they don't really believe in the role of the state. They don't believe in the role of government. They're quite happy to just have that be undermined. And that's what the Tea Party in the United States have done. But actually, if you believe that you need to use the power of government, the power of all of us collectively to change people's lives, you can't then think that you can achieve that if what you also do is not continually the democratic politics and the, the purpose of political parties that you need to achieve it. Um, there was a woman right at the back. Yeah. Oh, um, uh, you were talking earlier about healing the rifts uh, in the UK post-Brexit. And I was wondering what you think is going to heal the rift uh, within the Labour Party. Um, because you have a leader... <coughs> You're not a fan, are you? <laughs>
Revolution, that he talks about grand concepts. I mean, when I listen to his speeches, and I hear these grand concepts about these sort of justice and autonomy, but I don't get any actual policies, the economics of how he's going to lift people out of poverty. And I realise as I'm saying this, you're probably agreeing with me, and you probably can't say that. <laughs> say can you I think, um, <laughs> the, the, the thing is, so look, why, you know, you were quoting from my um, speech from the um, Labour leadership election 18 months ago. So look, I, you know, I had my say in, in this debate 18 months ago, and you know, since then the Labour Party's obviously been through another leadership election, and, and we've had that sort of turbulence and so on. I suppose what I would say is, um, I think two things. First of all, I think the big, the challenges for the Labour Party over the next, say, five to ten years are actually the sort of bigger ones about how you, um, how you stand up for progressive values and how you build um, the sort of progressive coalition in um, when the country is changing so fast and when the traditional bits of the Labour coalition are being pulled in different directions. You know, we've already had, I was, had, I was talking about before about the cities and the towns and sort of industrial and industrial towns and, uh, and London, and so on, being pulled in different directions. How do you have a progressive vision for both a kind of united country and also uh, to tackle those widening inequalities and the, the public services that you can unite us that can pull the bits of that coalition back together. And so I think there are, there are sort of bigger ideas than us simply doing the kind of the navel, navel gazing that, you know, otherwise we get sucked into just talking about, um, uh, you know, the, the kind of the going through the leadership contest issues all over again. <coughs> so think about what, what should, what kind of Labour Party do we want to be for the future? I would say rejoin, come back and be part of, of that debate. And then I would also say there's been a bit of a fashion to talk about, um, oh, well, we should have a progressive coalition. And what I would say is I think, for me, the Labour Party has always been a progressive coalition. That's what we, how we started. You know, we had the, the Fabians and the trade union movement, the Marxists and the Methodists. So we had all these different people coming together to be a parliamentary movement determined to change the country. And we did so in response to the Industrial Revolution. Now we have to do so in a new way in response to the Digital Revolution. But again, we should be, as a party, trying to be a broad party that reaches out, not a narrow party that then ends up just having to do deals with other parties because we can't reach out as ourselves but if we're going to be that progressive broad party that can reach out ourselves and build that kind of vision then actually we need you back in it we need a lot of other people back in it and uh, we need to all try and pull together with those ideas for the future um, in that speech that you gave though I think in Manchester um, presumably now looking back on it you, you feel vindicated by it I, you know, look, I, I had my say during that leadership election. We've been through that leadership election. It's, you know, we kind of move on to dealing with different things now and, you know, the challenges that we now have for the future. Okay, the chap there in the hideous check, check shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you're all very kind. Um, I think you're really interested in, um, in part because you were four and a half years, something like that, a shadow home secretary. You've probably seen up close and personal more of Theresa May, how she operates, how she works, what she thinks about things, how she puts into practice a Jeff Boycott-like opposition um, to policies and attacks and criticisms and how she locks down um, her ministers who work for her. And I think it'd be interesting to know what your kind of experience and learnings from you know, being up close and personal with um, Theresa May has been and how you'd approach that if you know, you were I think um, the interesting thing about um, Theresa May is, look, there's lots of things about um, Theresa May that I respect. She is uh, serious, thoughtful, and compared to the other candidates that stood for the, um, <laughs> the Tory leadership election, um, I think, you know, she will um, be, be more thoughtful 
about so many of the issues that she's facing. She, um, she tends to work very much closely on her own rather than to reach out and to work with people. And um, I think she gets locked into things and into positions, get a bit, a bit stuck in positions and isn't, doesn't change, isn't flexible. Uh, adapting to uh, you know new problems and, and things emerging or things not working, she gets stuck on them, which is how she's managed to get stuck on the net migration target, even when everybody else is saying, look, this is just not working. Uh, and she could have shifted from it. She had the opportunity to do so. Um, and that is a big worry when it comes to Brexit negotiations, when what you ought to be able to do is to be, to be flexible, to respond, to try and accommodate and to work with people rather than being a sort of dogged um, and narrow. I also think um, that actually you just kind of need to challenge her with evidence and with um, the sort of reality because there's always a massive gap between the, the re rhetoric and the reality um, in the way that Theresa May works. And actually, in many ways, the immigration thing is a really good example. You see, what she had as Home Secretary for many years was a lot of rhetoric and uh, a lot of stern words, but she failed in two ways. The first is she obviously didn't meet her own targets, put that aside. The much bigger failure was that she failed to actually address the sort of what deep public divide and anxiety that there is about immigration, so much so that actually anxiety about immigration at the end of her period of Home Secretary was worse than it was at the beginning. And she was nowhere in the EU referendum campaign where actually immigration was one of the central issues. And where if you had a strategic Home Secretary, you would have somebody who had been working out, okay, what's the big concern? Maybe it's about integration. Maybe it's about uh, support for public services. Maybe it's about different kinds of issues. Maybe it's around enforcement. But I'm going to try and address those public concerns with the reality, not just with a bit of rhetoric. And I'm going to be out there arguing about it and debating and trying to provide the reassurance in a referendum campaign. And she wasn't any of those things. So I think... The big challenge for her now will be the gap between the rhetoric in the Brexit speech, for example, that she's just given, and the reality of what she's able to deliver. To, to pick up the, the gender point that was mm. raised right at the back, is, there also an, is she also an example of the, the uh, tendency amongst a lot of political discourse in this country to underrate women? Probably, yes. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. I think also people misjudge the way there was a lot of focus on um, uh, is she just really indecisive? Um, and, uh, you know, until she made the speech this week, uh, people were saying, oh, she's too indecisive to be able to do this. I never thought that she was indecisive. We had the same experience her, with her when um, she was Home Secretary. We thought for a period that she was being really indecisive. Actually, what we kind of learned was, no, she just takes quite a long time to to work through her views and to then make a mind up and then she gets really sort of stuck in a position. Um, the, the risk with that, as I said, I think in terms of the Brexit stuff is look, we should be able to move faster when <coughs> things change. What about her personality? <coughs> I, mean, uh, I mean, and again, I, I think this may be a tendency for, I think there is a tendency in this political discourse for, to, for women to be seen as cold, if they're sort of at all if they are at all decisive, they're seen as cold. Um, and she is seen as cold. Do you, did you find her cold, or is she quite warm privately? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't meant to be a funny question. Uh, I'm still trying to work out why that's funny. She, uh, um, <coughs> she, Does she crack a good gag? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've not heard her tell jokes in private. Um, but I think... Um, I think she's, she's not, she doesn't reach out in the way that, that she works, so she's quite reserved um, as a way of working. You're right that probably, um, uh, yeah, women all sort of get, we can often be criticised for that, um, in a way that it would probably be just seen as a sort of dignified and statesmanlike yeah. if it was a man doing the same thing. Strong, yeah, yeah. Um, right, we've got... Uh, just 10 minutes, so I'm not going to go to the back because I've been to the back already. Uh, 
there and then there. If we, maybe if we take both of you very quickly, one after the other, and then we'll try and roll the answers together. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, no, no. The chap behind you. Chap behind you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. 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 We'll come back. We'll come back to you. We'll come back to you. <coughs> let's let's do three then. Let's do you, you, and you, one after the other, as quickly as possible. Sorry, uh, you briefly mentioned death penalty today in passing. I just wondered if I could ask you it, just to be an oracle for a moment in your position as a member of the Labour Party but also the chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee. Other than the obvious, which is probably the repeal of the Human Rights Act, what really will be this debate that comes to shape for the most broken Britons, or at least just the next five years of Britain, about law and order? I feel like at the moment, generally speaking, we're not talking about it as much as we were even a year ago. What specific sort of areas? Okay, the woman on the end. We'll, we'll take the three together. Yeah. By the way, do you really believe in the next general election, Jeremy Corbyn will be elected or not? If not, why he desperately do spend? I don't understand. What was the that last sentence you said? What? Do you think to really Jeremy Corbyn will be you know, the elected next uh, general election? And um, yes, well, go on. I'm sorry. going to ask on Scotland. Um, it seems rather potentially divisive in the body politic, party political. The, the, the ruling party, 10% of the country or less, does a lot of shouting and seems to have a policy of being totally negative. Is that a problem, and how do you see developments in Scotland for the Union, for the United Kingdom? Start um, with your deep Scottish roots, maybe. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So it's true. I was born in my Scotland. My my um uh, my parents moved around a lot when I was um when I was young. My dad was in the Forestry Commission for a while, so that was why we were living in Scotland for a while. We were living in we lived in Whitehaven for a while, which is where my mum grew up. Um, and then we moved. We were in Hampshire for a while. He was a um, uh, a trade union official after that became a, um, a trade union official which is how I sort of probably ended up with a lot of uh, labour politics growing up but it's true, I definitely don't have um, uh, a Scottish accent um, uh, as part of that and, um, but I have bits of a sort of very funny mix as well of kind of north-south because both my parents are, um, um, grew up in the north we had ended up growing up quite a lot in Hampshire and so as a result my, uh, my, my dad's family from Yorkshire as well so it's a really funny mix but it definitely Definitely not Scottish, um, and I wouldn't pretend so, and certainly didn't pretend so um, in the referendum campaign in Scotland when I went to do some campaigning um, in Inverness as well. The um, what would this in terms of what happens in Scotland? I think um, it's, hard, it's an interesting issue as well, which shows that somehow when you have these big referendums, those referendum issues can end up defining politics for quite a long time after. And so still in Scotland, they're not focusing on some of the problems they've got in the National Health Service or some of the problems in education and school standards. And it's still very much a, a kind of national debate um, that's happening. And that's probably increased as well by what's happened as a result of the EU referendum and kind of makes all of that uh, more salient again. So I don't know when... Um, sort of what's going to happen in terms of Scottish politics adjusting. I think this is actually really hard um, to predict. I don't think it's ever healthy, and I think that's what I was saying, like one of the questions we were talking about much earlier on, I don't think it's ever healthy to have, um, to have no opposition to a party, to have sort of concentrations of power, um, and to not have sort of checks and balances and challenge in place. And so... Um, you know, that's why I think we need, again, the Labour Party to strengthen um, in Scotland. I think Kezia Dugdale's great um, and is doing a good job, but it is still challenging circumstances because it does still feel as though the politics of the Scottish referendum and the EU referendum are very much dominant um, in the Scottish debate. Um, <coughs> your question is about, uh, will, will Labour be elected? What's going to happen? I think, look, we, we talked about the polls right now. That is really hard for us, and we have got a lot of work um, to do. So it's, you know, there's still um, a few years until the general election, and uh, we, you know, I think the, for, for me, it's about, in the end, there's people, look, there's people in my constituency who 
desperately, desperately need a Labour government. And, um, you know, when we lost the election in 2015, and actually it was on polling day, and I bumped into a woman who was in tears because <coughs> she couldn't afford to pay the poll, uh, not poll, she couldn't afford to pay the bedroom tax, and she'd just been given a, um, a served another warning um, from, because she was worrying about her rent and the bedroom tax and so on. And I'm saying to her, you've got to go out and vote because if the Labour government gets elected, we'll get rid of the bedroom tax. And then we lost the election, which meant she still got to pay the bedroom tax <coughs> and she still had to pay all of those arrears and so on. So, you know, I can't tell you this is easy and we are a long way behind at the moment, but we have to do everything we can between now and the general election to strengthen the Labour Party and to broaden out and to reach out across the whole country. There was one more question, wasn't there? Oh, yeah, big issues for the... Uh, what are the big issues going to define home affairs over the next few years? I think one of them is going to be about um, immigration. Look, this is a global issue because people are travelling and trading far more than ever. People are moving around the world. And you have seen the globalisation of people in a way that we previously thought about the globalisation of finance, the globalisation of goods. How do countries <coughs> respond to that, to have something which allows us to do what we have always done as a country, which is benefit from international ideas, from people coming to this country and building our biggest businesses or uh, working our public services and so on, and at the same time, have a system that can be managed, that you can manage the impact on communities, you can manage the integration, you can have the right kinds of controls in place, you can stop employers using immigration to undercut wages and jobs, which I have seen in my constituency. I have seen you know, the uh, big employers who use agency workers that recruit almost entirely from abroad that then uh, end up undercutting local wages and jobs and the way that that is exploited you have to deal with those kinds of things. So I think probably in home affairs, how you can find a, a kind of progressive approach and a sensible approach to immigration that isn't polarised is going to be the biggest challenge. If you're thinking about crime and, and uh, issues around uh, sort of crime and dealing with terrorism and the sort of obviously counter-terror issues are going to be huge. And then I think the other area is online crime and online abuse and the changing nature of so many of the things that we've worked out how to deal with offline and over very many years, that balance between liberty and security, that balance about how people behave towards each other, how things are policed offline, there's a whole new set of challenges about how you do that online, which I don't think we are anywhere near working out how to handle. Can I just, before we finish, just come back to the question that was asked just then. Um, Will you, at the next election, be able to argue to your constituents that Jeremy Corbyn will make a good Prime Minister? Well, that's why he's got to show everybody. That's what the whole challenge is for us. And it's not just, I think there is a, it's not just about, uh, you know, it's not just about the leader, it's actually about all of us being credible. No, so, okay, so, so I, I get from your answer that you think you'll be able to make a case for Labour. But based on what you've seen so far, will you be able to make a case for Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister? I hope I can. I hope that that's the work that we have done over the next few years. But we've got a lot of work to do. Thank you. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, just before, just before we go, and there is free wine uh, downstairs, uh, for those of you uh, that have booked tickets, we have uh, on this stage, same time next week, Nick Clegg. Uh, Lib Dems come along. Um, if, if nothing else, if ever in your life you come up with a slogan for something, you know after tonight it will never be worse than Tony Blair free pairs. Um, if you could thank Yvette Cooper, who I think has been absolutely fascinating. In